Stanford University. Um, so my name is Jeff Haney, uh, local Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Uh, it's my third venture back startup, so uh, I've been doing this a little bit. Uh, most all technology companies. Um, I've been in technology for quite a while. Um, probably a little bit longer than uh, most of you. I've been about doing it for about 25 years. So um, I, uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company here in Mountain View called Accelerator. I'll tell you a little bit about Accelerator, what we do, um, and should be of particular interest if you're doing uh, this class and you're interested in mobile development. Uh, Accelerator really is focused on enabling web developers, and very key, key word there, web developers, uh, allowing them to quickly create and commercialize mobile applications across a variety of, uh, of devices, mobile, desktop, tablet, et cetera. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit about what that means, uh, just a little bit about the company, just to get a perspective. We were founded a few years ago. We've raised $6 million in venture capital from Silicon Valley here, Storm Ventures and Larry Augustin, who's a well-known open source angel investor. We have about 18 employees growing uh, pretty quickly. Um, we have just a little bit of profile of the company. We have 46,000 registered developers using our software. So worldwide, so it's a fairly large growing base of developers worldwide using our software. Uh, millions and millions of devices that are installed, uh, software, are inst software is installed on, uh, and thousands of applications across uh, the, the various operating systems and things that we support. As you probably are well aware, the mobile landscape is shaping up to be very competitive, very interesting, and, and very large. Um, unlike the PC decade that we've just kind of come through, the mobile landscape is much, much more interesting, much more diverse. Uh, and there are many more players today than there were um, you know, 15 years ago when the PC came along. There's certainly, uh, we're here in, mostly around the Palm in this class, so Palm and, and the recent announcement of the merger with HP. Um, is a big player. Uh, eight, uh, of course, everybody's aware of Apple and Google with Android and, and the iPhone. Uh, Microsoft's always been in the mobile business for quite a while and, and certainly has announced a new, um, a new initiative with the Windows 7 phone. <clears throat> Research in Motion has been along, uh, and Nokia certainly is probably the largest mobile operator or mobile uh, handset manufacturer in the world still. Um, and mobile today, uh, a lot of people think of mobile, we think of handhelds and phone calls, uh, but mobile certainly, I think in the next few years is not, and, and already is uh, shaping up to not just be about uh, handhelds and phone calls, it's gonna be much, much more interesting. Uh, the tablets, today's Google TV announcement, um, we're already seeing TV-based things like Yahoo TV widgets, uh, the Kindle, uh, and then the Android tablet. Uh, we're gonna see the web and applications being connected into cars. Uh, via telematics, so we're going to see a lot more interesting things that when we think about mobility, we think about sort of how do you get data, how do you get applications across the web, um, and how do you do them across lots of different devices, which is a really, really exciting thing for end users and, and consumers. Android's a very, very large platform and growing pretty rapidly. It's pretty new still, um, but uh, it's growing very, very fast and very, very relevant. Android's being made by Google. Um, it's got hundreds of devices that are, are shipping already or being planned to ship very soon. Um, Android has its own set of issues uh, in the various versions, screen sizes. You've got different firmware loads from the different operators, the, the base modifications of the operating system because it's open source and all the capabilities uh, create kind of a unique set of problems um, as well as opportunities. Uh, this, this chart just came off of the Google website that they track the the, this is basically just simply tracking the, the platform versions and the sort of penetration of the percentage of devices. So you can already see that Android has not been out very long. It's got already a pretty significant fragmentation across various versions. 2.2 uh, .2 was just announced, I believe, yesterday uh, or today. Um, so of course it has zero penetration since it was just announced. But certainly it's got a lot of interesting features. A lot of carriers are going to be adopting it and a lot of different handset manufacturers. So that presents uh, a set of its uh, own issues since this is going to be probably um, by far probably the largest mobile operating system in the near future. The problem with all of these devices you're probably learning is that each one has its own programming language. Uh, pretty interesting if you're a student trying to learn all the various languages, not very interesting if you're a company or a small developer trying to make money on this because you can't reach all the beautiful devices, the billions and billions of devices out in the world um, simply by learning every single language and trying to maintain applications across all these various languages and platforms. It's, it's near impossible. 
Um, certainly, Objective C is a really cool language if you're familiar with iPhone and development in iPhone. It's a really cool language. I know that Stanford's got some really cool classes around iPhone development. Um, it's a very old language, but it's uh, primarily Apple. Um, then you've got various C++, again, great language, been around for a long, long time. Um, and Mojo, you've been learning a lot here in this course uh, from Palm. Java, the various versions of Java, um, APIs for ver the various manufacturers. So Java is the language is great, but each one of these platforms has different uh, APIs that are wildly different. So the Android Java SDK is much different than Midlet uh, or the RIM specific APIs. Uh, and then, of course, you've got .NET, HTML, et cetera. So there's, it's a very interesting uh, problem space. Um, how do you sort of deal with all these? How do you deal with all these manufacturers, all these operating systems, all these devices? Um, Multi-billions of devices are going to be out there, mo more than 2 billion devices, most likely. Um, and how do you deal with that? There's a big debate going on. Um, you've probably heard HTML5 is a, a spec that's been evolving for a long, long time. Uh, primarily started as a desktop web standards, uh, kind of the evolution of the uh, current HTML standard in the W3C. Uh, HTML5 uh, has been driven in the last couple of years really um, to try to add more and more application type functionality into the spec, uh, evolve the spec from what we think of it today as a very document oriented web into an application oriented set of capabilities. Um, and so a lot of people um, are hoping that HTML5 will solve this, that we'll simply write web pages for all the different devices, and much like we do today on the desktop web, and that will sort of come to rescue us. The problem is that um, in today's desktop web, it's still primarily dominated by a couple of browsers, i.e. pretty much has been until recently the, the majority desktop browser that most people use, especially in the corporate world. Um, and then you have Firefox and sort of the rest of the browsers. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of innovation with Safari and Chrome and, and all of that, and it's all very, very good. Um, but uh, HTML5 as a mobile standard is sort of a long way off. Um, and the sort of the problems that you end up having, um, there's massive patent worlds going on right now, even in HTML5 with video codecs and, and sort of the IP and licensing restrictions of the, the various technologies that go into video and all the mobile gestures and things like that, uh, there's a lot of patents. So uh, the standards don't certainly st solve patent issues for large companies. Uh, there's a lot of massive, uh, massive innovation, as you probably are well aware, going on in the, the mobile device arena and the tablet area. So with innovation, um, it makes it hard to write standards. Standards are written when you can get a group of people together, they can agree on how something should be done, and then they can go off and implement it together on a agreed spec. Um, so it's hard to actually create innovation and create interesting things in a standards body because you're sort of doing it um, de facto before it's actually been done before, and that's, that's not possible. So um, that poses its own issue as, as um, the multi-touch UI and all these sort of interesting things are happening in the mobile space, it's hard to sort of create standards around those things as they're moving quite quick. Uh, of course, the space itself is moving very fast, so standards take a very long time for people to agree upon how things should be done, um, get together, um, agree upon that, and then implement that. Um, and that takes a very, very long time. It's hard to do that when the space is moving so quick. And the other problem that sort of is more of a, you know, a lot of these are non-technical, is that um, most of these guys have everything to lose with the standards. So they don't necessarily have a good alignment from a business and a financial standpoint because to the degree that um, HTML5 becomes sort of the way that you build applications and you don't build those applications on Objective-C, let's say for iPhone, um, it, it moves you potentially in a, into sort of commoditizing the platform and not making it as important from a business standpoint. So while we do think that most of these uh, players would like to see more and more standards and we'd all like to see it as developers, um, they do have a little bit of a, uh, of a disincentive for doing that. So um, we, we will see. So you sort of need something in the middle. So um, we sort of said, wow, that's really an interesting opportunity. How do you use web skills, web standards, web technologies, and, and sort of the last decade and a half of all the innovation that's, that's happened in that, and how do you actually apply that towards native applications? Because native applications are emerging um, to be, at least for, for a while, the, the very interesting way that people will actually use applications on devices and, and create um, kind of interesting ways of interacting with content and, and people and, and uh, transactions. So we set up to build a product called Titanium a few years ago. We started it um, just about three years ago uh, next month. 
Um, it's, it's come a long way and it's taken a long time. Our solution is called Titanium. Um, it's really, really simple. If you take a whole group of web developers, there's way more web developers in the world than there are any other language uh, that, that we know of, uh, and, you, and you plug them into a product called uh, Titanium, which is, of course, um, our product, um, the idea is that you should be able to use a, um, a common kind of platform and adapt that, um, that application to a series of different uh, devices and, and modalities and handheld and form factors. So, and then those, uh, those devices are obviously being used by billions and billions of users all over the world. So that's the simple way of thinking about the solution. We think it's a full feature platform. Um, so it, it, you know, any kind of platform that does this, uh, you, you, the, the technical challenge that you have, the computer science challenge you have in a platform like this is how do you get away from being a least common denominator problem? Because anytime you're solving something that has to be on lots of different devices and lots of different permutations, you obviously have a, uh, a situation where you try to design towards the least common denominator to be able to um, be able to test and run across as many platforms as possible. Um, and so we've really tried to balance both, and I'll kind of show you some of that as we go through this, but we've really tried to balance the idea that it should be very, very full-featured. You should be able to do anything you can do in the native language. So, for example, iPhone, you should be able to do anything you can do in Objective-C in this platform. Um, or if it's the Mojo SDK or the PDK, you should be able to do anything you can do on Palm that you should be able to do in, in Titanium. Um, that's, the, that's the design challenge and, and the goal of the platform. So, um, we think a native user experience is a very important part of the emergence of these new types of applications. A native user experience says that when you're on that device, it actually acts, feels, looks, and, um, and is native to the platform that you're on. So if you're on an iPhone, it should act and feel and look like an, a native uh, iPhone app, and it should be a native iPhone app. Uh, if you're on the Palm, certainly Palm has a much different UI kind of me methodology and, and sort of design feel, stacks and swipes and things like that. So really, how do you sort of design an application that can run across these different modalities and different environments uh, and, and create a native user experience? And that's something we're trying to do. And of course, all the various different things that you'd expect in a platform, whether it's location-based services, playing, streaming audio, things like that, uh, being able to share with your social graph, push data to your... Um, you know, to things like Twitter, et cetera, being able to interact with data. Uh, more and more applications um, today are not just doing things on the device, they're actually interacting with, uh, with data on the web, pulling data back from the web, and, and um, things like that. Should have good analytics, good tools, and be able to be extend, uh, extended. So our platform today, uh, we support the uh, iPhone and iPad, uh, Android, BlackBerry is, is uh, also available, desktop, um, and I'll kind of uh, talk to you a little bit about the differences between them in a, in a few minutes, but desktop, we also uh, started with desktop before mobile, so we support Windows, Linux, OS X if you want to build a desktop application. Um, and we're working with Palm on Palm and uh, Microsoft on Windows Mobile, so those will be coming uh, this year as well. So just to show you a little bit, it's kind of hard to see on this black, this is kind of a you know, I like to sort of describe what you can do with technology by showing versus telling. So this is kind of something they just put together, a, a group, uh, I believe in Chicago, just put together a few days ago for an art exhibit. And they wanted to sort of show how do you use something like a blimp, a remote control blimp with a camera on it, how do you fly it around the room and use something like your iPad as your control mechanism. So you can actually use the iPad. And this is a slight video we can watch here for a second. This is all built in Titanium, certainly kind of a unique app. So what they've done is they've attached a blimp, radio control it, um, they put a camera on it, and it's a little hard to see, so, so this is the blimp. Uh, and what they're doing is they're going to fly it around. So they're using sort of the unique form factor of the, of the iPad to fly the blimp. And so then they say, well, let's put it in a social setting and see what happens. It's kind of cool. Let's, let's go take it to a party. It's a little hard to see here. I apologize. You can watch it on YouTube. But this is a whole bunch of people in a party, and they're all passing the iPad around, and they're all trying to take turns flying the blimp. The blimp itself is streaming live video as it flies around the room. The video camera on the blimp is being streamed back to the iPad, so you can actually control it, so fly it up to somebody and see what they're doing. That's the video display here. So it's kind of a cool, fun thing that you're doing. You can see the guy moving it around. Um, 
This was built with titanium. They simply used, um, they built a UI with titanium and then they actually, the camera integration, they streamed it back to a server. The blimp itself was streaming the video live. Okay, let me stop that. Um, and what they were able to do is they were able to actually um, talk from the iPad. They were able to talk back and forth to control the blimp. So they were able to send accelerometer events as the, as the accelerometer detection was moved and then control the blimp and they were able to move it around and fly. And so that's pretty cool. Um, titanium itself is really meant to be um, uh, really simple to actually build very powerful applications. So we've really tried to design it mostly thinking about the web developer. We're all web developers. We come from sort of that arena for the last uh, many years. So our thought is how do you use actually web standards, web specs, web kind of capabilities to do this and not necessarily esoteric languages that are lower level and not as productive. And so we think the web is a great way of doing that. Um, some of this stuff will probably look familiar, although syntactically um, it's going to be a lot different than probably the, the Palm SDK as far as the syntax, but the actual conceptual ideas are very similar. Um, so Titanium itself is a JavaScript based uh, API, um, very similar to the Mojo SDK. So you actually just invoke JavaScript APIs to actually create your application. Um, I'm going to do some demos here in a few minutes. Um, but what I thought we'd start out with something really, really simple um, and just take this video that we just did and actually stream it on, a, on an application. Um, the way you do that in Titanium is really simple. In Titanium, you can, um, the APIs are uh, either TI, which stands for Titanium, or Titanium. You can spell Titanium out if you really uh, like that. Um, some of us lazy programmers like to actually just do TI because it's, it's faster. Uh, and then you have namespaces of all the various types of uh, um, uh, various types of capabilities sort of packaged by, um, by function. So media, as you'd expect, has things like video player, streaming audio, radio, things like that, things that are kind of media related. Uh, databases lives in a database package or namespace. So you can sort of very easily identify um, what's what by the name. Uh, so it's, it's meant to be very readable. In Titanium, it's kind of a factory pattern. So you basically create objects. In this case, we're basically creating a video player. Um, and you give it a set of properties optionally. Um, those, of course, those properties can be set after creating the object as well. So we could cer certainly omit this URL here, uh, just create a video player with empty arguments or no arguments, get back a movie and do something like movie.url and then give it the URL. Um, that works both after construction or you could play the movie, um, start playing it, then do movie.url, give it a different URL, and that'll dynamically change the movie. So, um, it's, it's really, really simple, um, but, but really, really powerful. We do all the kind of complicated stuff underneath. You don't have to worry about things like garbage collection and memory management, all the things you might have to expect in a, in a lower level language because we handle all that for you. So in this case, and I'll, we'll kind of run right through it here in a second and show you uh, live. In this case, all we're doing is it's pretty readable. We're going to create a video player and then we're going to play the movie. So I simply took this YouTube video, converted it to a, uh, a movie file. Uh, and let's just switch over and see how that works. So what I'll do in Titanium, first uh, by way of introducing you, it's a little hard to see because it's black on black here, but um, this is Titanium Developer. This is what you download when you download Titanium. This is part of our tooling. Um, Titanium itself, um, as I mentioned earlier, is both supports desktop applications as well as mobile and tablet-based applications. This is a desktop application running in Mac, so it's an OSX application. It's a native application. Uh, it was built with Titanium. Um, we use Titanium to actually build Titanium, so it's kind of an interesting uh, computer science experiment. So just to, just to uh, give you that idea. So Titanium is laid out by a series of application projects. These are your projects that you're actually going to work on as a developer. Um, it allows you to select different projects and work on various projects at the same time. On the right-hand side, generally, is you have things like your uh, editing kind of properties of the project, uh, and then mainly you can test and package the project. Um, so which what we're going to do here. So I'm going to start off by creating a project. Um, in Titanium, you can sort of select the different types of project. You can select a desktop project, uh, a mobile project, uh, or a tablet-based project. Um, I'm going to start out with a mobile project. Um, but just as a side note, desktop, um, we, own, we support in desktop uh, more than just JavaScript. JavaScript's our primary language, how you interface with all the APIs. In desktop, we actually additionally give you the ability to uh, um, 
use Ruby, Python, or PHP as the language of choice. And you can intermix them. You could use PHP as well as JavaScript and use them at the same time. So it allows you to actually create applications in various languages. Because mobile and tablet have a kind of a different CPU and form factor limitation, we only support JavaScript in the mobile world. So JavaScript really is the, is the common de facto language between all our platforms. Uh, but certainly, um, it's kind of interesting on the desktop because you can use some additional languages. So I'll start with mobile. It's going to check to see what kind of prerequisites we have on your machine. In this case, I've already got the SDKs. Um, you can switch. In Titanium, we support various different versions. So you can switch back between, uh, very easily between different versions of our SDK, um, as well as downgrade, upgrade, and, and, and stuff like that. So I'll just start off with a, um, let's just call this iPad demo. So I'm just going to give it a name. Um, very similar here. I'm just going to give it a. Um, an application ID. This is just a unique ID to identify your application. Um, you typically use a dotted notation, something very similar to a domain name um, to create uniqueness. Uh, just give it some sort of temporary directory. Uh, and and the, there's some additional data uh, that we don't really care about right now, but I'll just use something like that. So we're going to create the project. When we create the project, it's just basically going to create your project, a, a shelled application. If we were to just run this project right off, um, we'll come over here to test and package. Um, you've got some different tabs here to run the emulator. Uh, you can tether and then run the application directly on device, um, or you can build a distribution for the stores, so the, for the marketplace uh, or the uh, iTunes marketplace or iTunes store. Uh, in this case, we, we won't go through that today, but um, it makes it really easy for you to do all that. So in this case, I'll run iPhone. You can select various uh, versions of the SDK here. Um, this is a logging filter to kind of change the logging level if you want to see more interesting information. I'm just going to run the kind of default out of the box application just to show you what it looks like really out of the box. Um, it's just a starter application that we're going to delete and, and move on just to show you this. What's happening is when we click launch, we're actually going to go off uh, and I'll kind of get a little bit more in details of what's happening behind the scene in a few minutes. But we're going to basically go off, check the SDK versions you're running. We're going to basically run our compiler. We take the JavaScript code that you've written, we compile it. Um, oops. We're going to compile it into, um, uh, in this case, because it's iPhone, it's Objective-C. Um, we're going to translate that. Uh, we're going to invoke the Xcode, which is the tool chain for iPhone, if you're familiar with iPhone. We're going to object, uh, object, uh, use the Objective-C to actually invoke the uh, Xcode tool chain, build your application, and then we're going to launch it in the native simulator. So that all just happened over here. It was telling me that it already had the simulator running. So there's your application. Very simple shelled application. Doesn't really do anything. It just gives you a couple tab groups, a couple windows, and just paints some basic information on. This is just a shell application. So let's start off then by going, let's go back over here and see where I put that. So that was iPad demo. So let's just open this up. Okay, so in Titanium, it's a simple project. We don't really try to invoke too much um, structure on you. So in Titanium, you have basically a resources directory. Um, App.js basically is our main entry point for your application. We basically have shelled this out. As you can see, that this is the application that we just ran. Let me just flip back over here, and I'll start by relaunching this real quick while we're going through this. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. So in this case, we've got two windows. Two tabs, rather. Two tabs with two windows. So in Titanium, the generic, uh, Titanium itself is a generic abstraction API. So that's why you get to multi-platform. Because uh, instead of using like the Mojo SDK or like the Cocoa uh, bindings or things like that, we actually create an abstraction that we try to actually design all the UI capabilities and all the non-UI capabilities in a way, and the APIs in a way that um, will work cross-platform. So in this case, uh, for us, we call these things tab groups, anything that can contain windows in a tabbing type function. I'll show you Android in a second, but Android looks wildly different than this. It actually is an Android-based tab. Um, while, while we're doing this, let me start the Android simulator because it takes a little bit. Let me see here. That takes a second to start the Android emulator the first time. So let me go back over here. So. Ah. So we call these a tab group, and I'll show you what it looks like in Android in a few minutes. So this is a tab group. Um, so in this way, uh, very much using a factory pattern, we create a tab group. You have a tab group object. Now, once you have that object, you can do things with it. So um, we call things that can live in a tab group. Tab group really is just a container. So 
Containers really have a visual construction, but they actually need content. So in this case, they take tabs. Tab groups take tabs. So in this case, a tab is another, uh, another co kind of construct that takes things like a window. So um, a tab basically is this area over here. Uh, and a tab has some basic attributes typically, such as an icon and a title and a root window. So window basically points to this root window, window one here. Uh, a window is just basically a visual construct that can live in something and display something. And typically a window takes up 100% of its container, um, although that doesn't, it doesn't have to. So by default, if you, did, if you don't give it any uh, boundaries here, which we're not doing here, it's going to take up 100% of its parent. The parent being the tab, so it's going to take up 100%. So in this case, we're basically just going to set the title of this tab to tab 1, um, which if I go back over here, you'll see. Some properties like title for the window work together. So as you see, as I tab back to tab one, it took the title from the window to say tab one. Um, in a tab group, the tab group works on things called window stacks. So you can have a stack of windows. Um, and it's very familiar if you've seen either an iPhone or an Android, when you open something, typically an iPhone, it'll slide to the left. Uh, and then it'll have automatically like a little back button up left. And if you click the back button, it slides away. That we call a window stack. So it's kind of similar to how Mojo does stacks in Palm. Um, their stacks are slightly different, obviously, from a UI, the way it looks. But very conceptually, I think, very similar. Um, so we call this a window stack. So windows can be opened. And it, when they're opened inside of a tab group, they pop onto the stack. And when they're closed, they pop off the stack. Uh, in this case, we're basically just creating two windows and two different tab groups. So in this case, let me slide down a little bit. We're also creating, uh, in this tab area, we're creating an icon. So the icon um, is this area over here. So you can see the icon here. Um, then inside this, we have a label. A label is exactly what you expect. It's a text label. Um, so we're creating a label called I am window. Uh, we're giving it a color. We're giving it a font, a generic font. We're giving it some alignment properties. And we're giving it uh, some dimensions. Um, we call these views, these windows and labels, and they're all, at the end of the day, views. Basically, views are just uh, some visual representation of how you render something on the screen. So it's a model view controller paradigm, whereas the view is basically just the visual area that you're going to paint to. Um, and then these are sort of specific implementations of views. So create label is just a type, a specialization of a type of view. It's called a label view. So in this case, we're just giving it some properties. All views can have um, custom properties. Uh, and then like this, like these are label specific areas like uh, text align is something label specific. Uh, there's common properties that all views things have like width is a good example. Width um, says how do I size that view relative to its parent. In this case, I'm going to say make the width auto. In other words, make it as dynamic as the text will allow me. So the more text I have, the wider it will be. And the less text I have, the, the smaller it will be. So it basically will auto size the width or the height based on um, uh, you know, based on how, how big the, the contents are. You could also give it, in this case, like it's a label, you could also give it a specific set of pixels. I only want it to be 100 pixels wide. In that case, it'll center align it to 100 pixels and it'll truncate it if it's more than, more than that. And you can kind of control the types of truncation you want to, whether you want to just be cut off visually, whether you want to ellipsis and give it dots, things like that. So each one of these types of uh, higher level views uh, have these types of properties that allow you to actually control control it. So in this case, um, what we're going to do, views then basically are like a hierarchy. If you can think of it like a hierarchy, like a tree basically, where you can put things, uh, attach things to them. So in this case, a label gets attached to the window. So we're going to put the label in the window because we, we want the label to be rendered inside the window. The parent becomes the window and we're going to basically add the label to the window. And then let's slide down. Uh, and then we're going to basically do the same thing for the second window. And then it, because it's a hierarchy, so we're going to basically then add the tab to the tab group and then tell the tab group to open. The part, everything we're doing up until this time is basically just constructing all the information, the model data about how to actually render uh, this on screen. But until we actually open it, it's not actually going to be rendered. So um, the open actually causes it to open the tab group uh, and close does exactly what you'd expect. It closes it. It makes it goes off screen. It makes it become not visible anymore. So um, 
that's basically a very simple layout of the of this uh, of this. Let me now show you if I can. What it looks like same exact code running on iPhone. So iPhone obviously has kind of a different looking tab. This is the Android tab uh, navigation. And you can see the, the contents look the same because basically they are the same in, in the sense that the window basically has the same kind of content, same icons, et cetera. So what you get is when an, when an Android-based user runs this application, this will be very familiar with them because they're used to seeing apps that have this sort of tab navigation. When an iPhone user runs this app, they're going to be very familiar because they're used to seeing this on an iPhone native application. So, uh, but the code is the same. So that's at least the idea. So let me shut this down because this takes up a little bit of memory here. So now let's just see what happens if we were to actually do something a little bit more fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that little video. I think I have the video here in my movies. I called the video iPad Blimp. So I'm just going to copy it into my, I think I called it demo, yep. I'm just going to copy it into my resources folder. Anything you put in the resources folder Let's just go back over here and you can see it. Anything you put over here in the resources folder uh, will get compiled into your application. All the JavaScript, HTML, CSS, that is compiled down into the native platform language. So those won't be actually in your application. Uh, but any other resources like movie files or WAV files or text files or anything like that will actually show up in your application. And so then you can actually reference them as if they were uh, local. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to create a player. And it's about as easy to expect. Create video player. In this case, I'm going to give it a URL. I think we called it iPad Blimp. So iPad underscore Blimp dot MOV. And then we're just going to say player play. Now, what do we think play does? Extra credit. <laughs> Plays. OK, so let's just run this. Oops, I ran the wrong one. Sorry. Let's go back over here. So um, what this should do here, I did this right. You can turn on debug, and you'll see here, you'll, it's hard to read on this. But you'll get some slightly different color commands. So in this case, basically, it automatically switched. You can actually see a little bit better on this player. That's good. Um, it'll actually just rotate because that's how iPhone does their videos full screen. Um, you can do things like control control this uh, movie controls. By default it's going to show it. Um, turn the music off. You can also on the video player you could actually create a label in Titanium and add that label on top of the video surface. Um, or if you wanted to add like a video view. Um, so if you wanted to add for example if you want to annotate data on top of the video surface as it's playing, you would simply just create like a label or an image or any, any sort of uh, titanium oriented view and you could simply add it to the video surface. Um, and that becomes pretty nice. If, for example, if you're doing something like augmented reality, you wouldn't be playing a video, you might be using your camera. Um, let's say you want to use your camera and as I'm looking over my camera, um, I want to do something like uh, get my geolocation, so I want to figure where I'm at. I want to go somewhere to a web service online, and I want to find out everything, let's say Yelp or Foursquare, and I find everything around me. And I want to take that data, maybe I want to paint something on the screen as I'm looking at it. That's called augmented reality. Um, in Titanium, we have several demos to show you how to do that. Um, that would simply be in Titanium, you'd create the camera, it would bring the camera up, and you, you would just uh, add that data to the camera surface, uh, just like you would any view. Okay, so let me go back over here. So that's, that's just a simple, let's get back to the presentation. That's just a simple way, um, just to show you how simple titanium is, just a quick little example. I'll give a, give a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but that's uh, creating a video player. We try to design the API so that they're very, very simple, very straightforward, and, and sort of easy to read and easy to understand. We think that makes good APIs. Um, so I talked a little uh, briefly about what's happening, just to go a little bit more detail. What's happening is we, we basically take, and it's, it's different for each platform, Part, partly a lot of the magic that happens with Titanium is the, the API certainly is designed, we have tools, um, but a lot of the magic is in this, uh, what we call the SDKs. These are the actual 
um, SDKs that are specific to each platform. So we have like a mobile SDK contains, for example, an iPhone sub SDK that knows how to basically take your code, compile that code, generate Xcode project, generate X, uh, Objective-C, and then interface with the, with the um, iPhone tool chain to actually basically compile that app into a real native application um, in iPhone. It's very similar to what a human might do if they sat down and actually wrote this. Obviously, a machine's doing it instead of a human, and so the machine's going to be a lot more efficient and, and can do a lot more interesting things with the code. But effectively, it's very similar. If you understood Objective-C and could sit down and write this yourself, uh, certainly with a lot more code, this is what we're doing in Titanium, um, but a lot more optimization. And so we're using basically the same native packaging. Um, the benefits are probably obvious, but the benefits are you get native performance, native capabilities, but at web development speed. I mean, we did something that in Objective-C, that would have taken us probably 10, 15 minutes. It wouldn't have been too big of a deal, um, simply because that was pretty simple in Objective-C, but you can envision as the complexity order gets much larger, um, the time investment and the debugging and, and sort of the, you know, things like that become um, uh, much harder as well and much, take much longer. So we, we try to do a lot of that capability for you. Um, just a few of the APIs you, you would probably um, uh, interact with when you use Titanium. They're uh, pretty diverse and pretty wide. Um, everything from like doing things like location-based services, whether it's a reverse geolocation or a forward geolocation, you know, give me a, tell me where I'm at, um, and, and give me the coordinates, um, or given some coordinates, tell me where I'm at. Um, you know, given a lat long, tell me what street I'm on, uh, or given a street, tell me, you know, tell me what lat long that is. Um, with that, you know, of course, you can, you can use all sorts of very interesting things on the web to find out, for example, tell me what the nearest pizza restaurant is given this lat long. Um, so we support uh, natively geolocation services. Um, SQL database, that's, uh, that's nice. You have an onboard kind of application specific uh, database that's abstract. You can basically do things like, you know, store local data in the database uh, for the application. Um, Sound and video, you can stream audio locally, stream audio from the web, you can stream audio from an internet radio station. Uh, for example, if we were streaming this, you could sort of stream that data real time. Um, file systems, exactly what you expect, saving files locally. Uh, let's say I want to fetch something down, let's say I want to fetch something like a video from the web, uh, but I want to store it locally so I don't have to go to the web, let's say if I'm offline, I could actually fetch it, save it to the file system on the physical device and then play it from the web in the future. Uh, it's nicer for things like caching and things like that. Camera, uh, you've got, of course, a full uh, 2 and 3D animation space. You can do all sorts of cool animation. I'll show you a few of examples of this in a few minutes uh, of some of these uh, various APIs. Uh, networking is exactly what you expect. Going to the network to be able to do things like sockets or bonjour services. Um, in fact, the iPad demo I just showed you, they were using our sockets to actually communicate back to the remote control vehicle and control it. Uh, via low-level sockets, native mappings, uh, gestures, uh, um, built-in uh, Facebook and, and Yahoo YQL services uh, for sort of social graph interactions, already built in, uh, web services, et cetera. And these are just a few. I mean, there's, there's, uh, we have probably about 700 total APIs, so it's a pretty wide ranging. Uh, the challenge, uh, again, with a technology like this is how do you map these APIs into the actual platform level APIs? And, and that's where we do a lot of our work. Um, one of the ways that we try to avoid the, the problem with least common denominators, because not all these platforms today have uh, every single API, but there, you know, the good news is, there's, uh, back to the competitive nature of the space, um, you know, there's a lot of commonality. In fact, there's very close commonality in APIs and capabilities between, for example, iPhone, Palm, um, you know, uh, Android, and some of the other uh, kind of common emerging smartphone platforms. So it's actually not that different. The UIs look different, the capabilities certainly can be different, um, but you can actually create uh, a, a fairly nice solution like Titanium to actually map a lot. Um, what we do though in cases where you can, or they're just totally different, a good example in, in iPhone is that iPhone has a concept of badges. Um, okay, sorry, I left the app down. So in iPhone you have this concept of badges. If I launch, um, well, I won't do that. 
I'm sure you guys have all seen it in an iPhone. You can sort of see like tabs, and tabs will have like a little red badge indicator, or you might see an icon on the, on the springboard that has a badge. That's called a badge icon. That's meant to indicate from a UI standpoint that some notifications happen. You've got some number of unread messages or SMS or things like that. That's called a, a badge. And you can either put them on, a, on an app icon, or you can put them on a tab. Um, and that is, um, that's kind of unique. In this case, that's kind of unique to iPhone. So we have a kind of a separate set of uh, iPad and iPhone namespaces. So where you see titanium.ui, you will also see occasionally a titanium.ui.iPhone. And those are like iPhone-specific UI elements that are not portable. They only work on iPhone. Uh, and you'll see the same on Android, the same on Palm, et cetera. So those allow, what we try to do here is we're trying to sort of have the best of both worlds. We want to basically have as much common as we can. So if it's in a titanium namespace, it's not specific to a platform, it'll, uh, it should work uh, across all platforms. So um, if you see something that's obviously in an iPad or an iPhone namespace, then it will only work on those platforms. So it allows you actually to kind of mix and match. And then you can use very similar to you'd, you'd expect uh, in most programming languages, you can use if logic or uh, pound-defined type logic to actually conditionally compile your app and the, and the various uh, capabilities based on the device you're in. Um, and I'll show you a, a little bit of that here in a second. The other, the other thing you can do if you don't have something, and the other problem with the least common denominator solution is what happens if we don't support something that you need? I mean, there's some cool new thing that you need to do or some cool uh, OpenGL kind of capability you want to build in, and, and we just, you don't have that capability at the high level. Very similar to what Palm's done is we've created a module SDK. Palm's got what's called a platform SDK to extend the platform at the low level using C, C++. Um, if you can't do it in Mojo, we have something very similar called the module SDK that actually allows you to actually extend Titanium. And Titanium itself is built on this SDK. So we actually use the same SDK to actually build all the modules and capabilities you saw on the previous slide. Um, it allows you to actually module these extensions. We call them modules. Um, you have to use the language of the platform, obviously, because you're writing platform code. So you're writing Objective-C code if you're extending uh, iPhone capabilities um, for the platform. Uh, and, but what it allows you to actually do is to, um, to once you write your module, um, you can basically, pa it will package your module up automatically, and when our compiler tools run, we'll automatically pull your module code in. And we, what we do is we automatically expose your properties and functions that you write in your module up into JavaScript. So the people that then use your module, very similar to the, how they would uh, use everything else in Titanium, they would use JavaScript to actually interface with it. So it makes it really nice to actually extend the platform. Um, and we have lots of people that do this with Titanium. All right, so let me show you another couple set of demos, and then we'll take a break here in a few minutes and uh, do some questions. So we have an app called Kitchen Sink. Watch this. It's exactly probably what you'd expect. It's everything in the kitchen sink. So it's. Uh, it's a pretty big application as far as capabilities. Um, I won't be able to go through even you know, one one hundredth of the application because it's so, so large. But um, it's sort of laid out, um, it's sort of laid out in UI kind of capabilities, um, controls, which are sort of widget, kind of higher level sort of visual things that you want to do, switches, sliders, things like that, um, phone capabilities. Phone capabilities are like things inherent to the phone, like camera or movie playing, things like that. Platform are sort of like non-phone specific things like web services or network sockets, things like that, things that are kind of inherent to the platform. Uh, and then mashups are sort of like web services, things like Facebook or talking to a, you know, a Foursquare service, things like that, so you can sort of see how that works. Um, so I'll show you a few kind of low-level low um, uh, UI capabilities. Um, this sort of just shows you how you can do the various, I mean, the, the, the idea of this application is we give it to everybody who uses Titanium as a way for them to understand sort of code and visually how to do certain things in Titanium just by example. So in this case, we're just showing you all sorts of various types of windows. And, and certainly, this isn't all inclusive. This is simply just a, a wide range of ways that you can do windows. So for example, this is just a plain window. It's simple, plain window. Um, you know, this is a window where you're having a little bit of animation, and you're covering the nav bar. Um, 
This is what you might call a traditional modal window where you want to actually take input and you can't let that window go away until they're done. Um, this is kind of nice because this is like showing animation so I can animate a window as it opens and animate it as it closes and so it sort of shows you how to do some animation. Um, this sort of just shows you how you can sort of slide things up but keep the, the navigation visible still. This is a full screen window so you have no Chrome when I'm in full screen. Um, you know, this is showing you how you can put a toolbar on a new window and this is just showing you how you can animate that toolbar. Probably impractical in most real applications, but it sort of shows you how you can do sort of animation within windows. Um, and this shows you kind of a neat little window. It's a window that's not full screen. It's a window that just sort of, um, uh, sort of animates. The window itself is just an image that's being animated um, with, a, with a, uh, a 2D transform. So it just shows you how you can do it. And this is just basically sliding the window out. So uh, these are just sort of showing you different ways you can do these windows. Views, we have tons and tons of views in Titanium. So views are kind of higher level. We have a, a low level view. It's just a visual representation of something on the screen. Uh, and then we have very concrete implementation of those views. Uh, that come out of the box, things like image views, um, and then you know you can see each one of these types of views has all sorts of different crazy uh, ways of doing it. So basic image views is just this is an image. Um, you know you can have animated images. You know this is like an animated image where we're controlling the animation of a whole bunch of frames to create sort of a video-like thing, uh, and you can sort of stop it and start it. You know this is just sort of showing you the frame rates, etc. Certainly, we can do things like uh, crazy things like, uh, you know, this is called image masking, where I'm taking an image and I'm masking certain parts of the image to recolor the image. So this is actually an image out of the MTV's Jersey Shore application that was built with Titanium. Um, and so you got sort of all sorts of different ways of doing images. Um, scroll views. Scroll views are are these are these scrollable areas where you can have con more content than you have visually and so it creates automatically like the scroll bar. Um, and so these are just different ways you can do scrollable. These are what we call scrollable views where you can have scrollable views that kind of move automatically back and forth. Um, table views are what you'd expect. These are, you know, everything you've been seeing pretty much is are table views. These are all sorts of different types of ways. I mean, Table view is probably one of the most used uh, types of layouts in most uh, iPhone and, and Android type applications. So these are just different ways and different ways you can style uh, views, different kinds of layouts you might do. This is familiar if you use Facebook. Um, you know, and these are just sort of showing you this is the Chipotle layout if you ever use Chipotle on your iPhone. Or, you know, so this is just sort of showing you all sorts of different ways you might be able to style your tables. Um, pretty much all the same code, it's just sort of different graphics to sort of give you different styling. So this is just a bunch of different table view examples. Of course we have web views. Web views are exactly what you expect. Given a URL, just render a web view. Uh, it's a, it's a full-blown view that just wherever you, area you give it, you give it a URL to a website or a web URL that might be in your local project. In this case, I just gave it your Google and it's going and rendering Google. And it's, you know, it's a full fi featured, you know, yeah, it's a full featured you know, uh, view. Um, of course, that web view could be an image as much as it could be anything else, or it could be something like uh, something like a PDF, you know, where I'm going out and I'm rendering a PDF inside a web view, and this is just a PDF here. Uh, there's all sorts of types of views. You've got uh, you know, things like maps. These are native maps built into it. Of course, all of these are programmatically controlled. So in this case, I'm programmatically creating this pin. I'm associating all the graphics with the pin. Um, this, this whole demo right here is probably like uh, 15 lines of code. So it's, it's really, really powerful to do like a native Google Maps implementation uh, in Titanium. Uh, and then, you know, it shows you how you can do things like mixing views. So we're um, most of the views that we've shown you really are kind of full screen within the parent. This, but views don't have to be. I mean, views, you give them dimensions. So in this case, we're just giving it like a 50% dimension. So the view, the map view takes up half of the area. In this case, we're giving it a web view that takes up the other half. So you can compose these. They can also be stacked. Um, so you can basically, I thought I had an example here for z-indexing. 
you know, views themselves can have Z index. So Z indexing is the order of which they stack. So if I put the same view in the same location, um, the last view uh, that's added would be on top of the previous view unless you had a Z order or a, what's called a Z index. So a Z index just allows you to control which one. So it's like layers. So in this case, we're just stacking uh, various different views with the background color and giving it a different Z index. You can see how that looks. Um, you got things like cover flow. Um, cover flow is like a specific, specific view that allows you actually kind of like the iTunes look where you can kind of cover flow things together, et cetera. So these are all different types of views. There's, there's more than this, but uh, different types of views. Um, go on and show you controls. Controls are like things like sliders uh, or switches. Again, all this code is you know, pretty much the same. It's gonna, the, the controls themselves, like what an activity indicator looks like, will look, this is like a little activity indicator. It'll look a little different depending on the platform that you're on, but, but primarily a lot of the controls look very similar. Uh, of course, you've got things like buttons, you know, how, you know, all sorts of different ways you can do with buttons, et cetera. I won't go through all of them, but you've got just tons of everything. Everything that you could expect that you'd be able to do on the platform, um, Pretty much titanium allows you to do something like a picker, uh, et cetera. Phone, we've, we've looked at movies, so I won't go through that. Um, geolocation is not that example, uh, not that exciting from, uh, from a demo perspective, but uh, we just went out and kind of found where we were. Um, when you run inside the 3.1 emulator on iPhone, it always reports one infinite loop. So it thinks we're at one infinite loop. In fact, when I, I'll show you the Foursquare demo. When we do the Foursquare demo, it'll actually show you areas next to Apple's headquarters. Uh, in the 3.2 emulator, just uh, in the 4.0 and 3.2 and 4.0 iPhone SDK, um, you can now actually get the real geolocation of, of where you're at instead of actually always reporting infinite loop. Um, some of these you actually want to run on device to actually see, um, like camera, for example. You can't use a camera on, on the simulator, but this shows you how, you know, if you run this on, a, on an actual uh, camera, you can do things like augmented reality. It shows you how you can do some kind of cool augmented reality type stuff and control the camera in various different ways. Um, recording video, all, all sorts of different things. I won't go through all these. I mean, there's just databases, you know, XML, all, all sorts of stuff that you might expect to be able to do. Um, you know, I'll show you the four square. If I remember what my four square is. Let's see if I can remember. So it's using geolocation to find our address, which it got here. Uh, and then you can see here it's Apple because it's one infinite loop. So it determined our geo. It went to Foursquare and just said, hey, Foursquare, here's my lat long. Give me the venues nearby uh, that people have checked into. And so, you know, and then it just put the results in like a little scrollable view so you can sort of see what they are. So really, really simple. So nice thing is it kind of shows you how you can use various APIs, things like Facebook. Um, so in this case, I'll just sort of show you Facebook. This is all sort of built in. So, so here we go. So we're going to go out to Facebook. I'm going to authenticate the app. So now I'm logged in. Uh, this, this just shows you how you can do some different things. So let's just do, let's say, a stream. Let's publish to my stream and say, Okay, so publish to your app. So let's just say, hello from Stanford University. Okay, it's published. Now let's go over here to my Facebook. Oh, gotta log in. All right. So if I go to my profile, there it is. Hello from Stanford. So, you know, not that interesting probably, but uh, but certainly uh, now let me show you. Uh, we'll just sort of go here for just a second. I'll show you just to just to kind of tie it together. Just a couple of uh, the code behind some of this. Let me just show you Facebook, and then I'll take some questions as we run out of time here. So Facebook, let me just show you the publish stream. So um, in Facebook, you have this idea of a button. So I've just created a button. I've given it some information about my application, which is an API key. Um, I've added the button to the window. It acts like a normal button, except it renders a Facebook Connect login. 
Um, buttons, I've just added an event listener for the click. So I want to know when I click on that button, um, I'm going to first check to see if I'm logged in. If I'm not logged in, uh, it's going to basically say, hey, you need to go log in first. Uh, and then basically, this is all I have to do to publish something to Facebook. Titanium Facebook Publish Stream. I give it a hint that's going to display in the little dialog. Uh, I mean, there's a couple optional parameters that I can attach, like I can attach additional stuff. In this case, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to give it the default. And I can pass it a function that's going to be called back, which is what this is, when the, when the response from Facebook comes back. Um, the other option I have here is this is going to be what we actually ran here. So the other one is I want to pass some structured data here. So in this case, I'm going to do some structured data. We saw this on... Uh, when we saw the Facebook here. So see how I've got this icon and I've got this data here that I want to show up in the stream? So that's what this data here is. I'm controlling that from my, my app. So I'm giving it the caption, the description. Um, I'm giving it a media, which is an image. It could be a video that you recorded locally. I mean, I'm doing this statically. It could be dynamically, right? I could have, I could have taken, a, taken a video or taken a picture, created the media type dynamically, and then done the post. So in this case, I'm doing it statically. I'm giving it an image predefined image to a remote JPEG so Facebook can fetch it. Um, and I'm giving some properties here that I want to show up that I want to like link here. So if you go back, we can see it here. So here's Absolver homepage. This is my link um, that I'm doing, doing back here. So my text that I want to link and then the href. And so in this case, slide down a little bit. Same exact one as the status above. It's just I'm giving it this data object which is going to use. So when I actually publish this stream, um, I'm going to say use this data as part of the data payload for the stream that I'm going to put on my Facebook wall. Um, and so in this case, I'm just doing publish stream. Now, this obviously publishes on the user that logged in and associated their app with their profile, their social stream. So just to show you, it's really, really powerful. Of course, this works across the various platforms, so it's cross-platform code. So um, that's, just, uh, that's just the way sort of Titanium works. It tries to be really easy. So let me maybe stop there and see if anybody has any questions, clarifications, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, for the iPhone uh, table views, are you using Core Data for the, like, did you use the SQL stuff to, like, That's a good question. So the question was for people in video, um, on the table views for iPhone, are we using Core Data? So Core Data is a, a, another way, an Apple built-in way you can store data. Um, we are not. Um, uh, Core Data is sort of, we use SQLite as our database or because it's very portable, very lightweight. Um, Core Data is very specific to Apple and iPhone, so, um, and you use their tools. So we basically use SQLite because that then runs on every single device, very compact, very small, um, and very portable. You can use it on desktop, et cetera. And uh, the table views, the table views themselves don't have to be actually pulled from a database. They can actually be dynamic. So oh, right. So in fact, you know, where it's static data, you might just have it in line in your application. Most of the cases, for example, Twitter, you're gonna, you know, or Facebook application, where you're pulling remote data and dynamically displaying stuff in the table view, obviously you're coming from the network or you're coming from a database to get that data. So, good question. Anything else? Next question. Yes. Uh, what do you think of, uh, do you read about the Chrome uh, OS native support for C++? Yeah. Are you guys gonna support that? Or? Uh, so the question was native support for Chrome OS or... Are like, you talking about like native client? Uh, are you talking about the native client project? or Because there's various, various different things that they're doing there. Uh, where they actually like inline C++ just within the... Yeah, it's a native client type. Yeah. So the question was about Chrome's native C++ support. Um, we might allow that. I mean, again, our target really are web developers. These are mostly developers who probably don't have C++ no. background. If they do have it, they don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. these, are, these are developers who, who want to actually be able to leverage the web as a language, a programming model, and tools, basically. But certainly, yeah, I mean, you could, uh, you could extend our platform very similar. It wouldn't be in line the way they're doing it, but using our module SDK is, is, is obviously C++ or uh, Objective-C or Java. Any other questions? Okay. Have you guys built your apps yet? No? Man. Final presentation. Final presentation. All right. No pressure. Okay. Um, just last couple of 
set of slides. Uh, I think we're done. Basically, okay, yeah, another question? So if you run into a case um, or uh, something you want to customize, uh, you, you don't know how to do uh, with Accelerator, Titanium, um, can you just uh, get the code for like a specific, like for iPhone or for Android and then modify it yourself? Yeah. So the question was, can you, if you want to modify the code directly instead of actually having to do it in Titanium? Yeah. yeah. You could certainly do that. Um, I didn't show you, but I will show you real quick. Um, behind the scenes, Titanium, and this is available. So if we take this project that I created, this temp iPhone, let me go in here and I'll say open iPad demo. Uh, there's a build folder for each platform that's been created. And this build folder, we'll just sort of say the name of our demo.xcode project. If I open that up, you'll actually see your Xcode project and everything that Titanium has generated. And you can actually run it even from within Xcode, which is kind of cool. So if I wanted to actually run this, let's see, I want to run this on 3.1 simulator, and I want to run this directly out of Xcode, um, I can actually see everything that was done, generated behind the scenes, and actually I can run it from the, um, you know, Xcode in this case, um, which it's going to take a while because it's got a ton of source here, but we'll give it a second. But um, so. Um, you could go into our direct code that's generated and start hacking it. Um, it's not recommended simply because as you move between various versions, oops, now that's a problem because I think I deleted something. So sorry about that. But um, but uh, you can um, you could start hacking directly. Like I could go into a module like this AV recorder module, which is one of the recording generated modules, and I could start hacking on some of the code that was generated here. Um, but I probably wouldn't want to. We'd probably we would recommend that, that we have ways that you can sort of modify the code to allow for sort of forward compatibility with our APIs and forward compatibility to upgrades to our SDK. So if we upgrade our SDK or if you change code, some of this code may be regenerated. And so you want to be careful that you don't sort of modify something and then have it regenerated and overwrite your modifications. So we have ways that you can do that where you can mark it and you can build a module and do that to be able to modify it. Um, certainly, Titanium itself is all open source, so you can certainly fork our code. Independent of this specific project, you can actually also uh, go to GitHub, fork our code, hack on our code as well, and, and you know it's a very open open source project. So um, we also have a lot of people that do that as well and submit patches back or things like that. So, um, but very good question. Any other questions? All right, well, uh, just to finally wrap up, if, uh, if you're interested in Titanium, um, it's, uh, it's available free of charge, absolutely.com. So uh, feel free to download it, and it's on GitHub as well, uh, if you're familiar with open source GitHub for projects for open source. So it's available at uh, Absolutor under GitHub slash Um All of our source code and everything we do is pretty much there. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.